the judgment has set. If he tells you to leave the church, he's on the wrong track. Move by the devil. This is God's church. What God needs is revival and reformation in the church. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means Ezekiel 3, somebody says, but pastor, if you show it clear, if you give it straight, if you give it so hard, they won't fight you back anymore. That's all right. They put Jesus on the cross. I told you, you don't have a man in the Bible that stood for truth that was not in trouble. They called Elijah a troublemaker. They took Isaiah and cut him in half. They took Jeremiah and threw him in a pit. They took Peter and crucified him upside down. They took John the Baptist and cut his hair off. They took James and threw him to the block. They took Paul and crucified him they t and killed him. They took Jesus, the man of righteousness, and he was nailed to a tree. You don't have a man in the Bible that stood for truth that wasn't in trouble. So if you are in trouble today, it's all right if we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Now don't be in trouble for foolishness. You better be in trouble for the truth's sake. Not because of apostasy, not because of, 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 uh, uh, of leaving the truth, but you better stand for truth. Someone says, well, if you preach like that, do you think everybody's going to hear you? Well, I'm not a fool. Do you think that everybody in the church, leaders and loyalty, ministers and members, clergy and common people, you think everybody is just going to get in line? Well, if they didn't listen to Jesus and he was a green tree, what do you think they're going to do to a dry tree? You know, if you ask any minister or an evangelist, they were trained that when they go out and do evangelistic meetings, that when they teach the world about the truth, that they tell them, don't put your trust in what men say. Isn't that what we do when we do evangelistic meetings? We talk about the seventh day Sabbath, and a man has been going to church on Sunday all of his life, and we tell him, well, we're on the seventh day of the Sabbath based on the word of God. And all of a sudden, the man says, well, my church says. What do we tell him? We say, well, it's not about what your church says. It's not about what tradition says. It's not about what your pastor says. We tell them, what does the Bible say? Isn't that what we tell them in evangelism meetings? Isn't that right? They've been growing pig farms all their lives. I was on one island. All they had was pig farms. And when they became seven Adventists, they, they gave up their livelihood. And you know what the seven Adventists of that group said? The seven Adventists of that group said, the seven Adventists of that group said, they said, listen. They said, have faith in God. God will take care of you. Believe in the word of God. We exalt the word of God when we talk in evangelistic meetings. But it's amazing sometimes once we get in the church, no longer do we exalt the word of God. How can we tell the non-believer when he's out there, don't believe in tradition and what church says or what man says or what minister says, what does the Bible say? And then get in the church and tell them, well, our church manual says it's all right. That's hypocrisy. How can we tell them have faith in God and trust in Jesus when we tell them to change from eating pork? But when the same Bible tells us we must go into the most holy place and take on a new diet in the anti-typical day of atonement, we say, well, that's not true. That's hypocrisy. How can we tell the world out there that, that, that they need to clean up and believe in the word of God above tradition and then get in the church and put it down? Someone say, everybody's going to believe. No, everybody's not going to believe it. But listen, the job of the minister is not to make you believe. The job of the minister is to give you the unadulterated truth whether you like it or not. Ezekiel chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 17, the Bible says, Son of man. I have made thee an entertainer to the house of Israel. No, that's not the right translation if that's what your Bible read. God says, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. 
Do you know we're told in the spirit of prophecy that every seven at Venice is called to be watchmen just as verily as Ezekiel. Volume 9, page 19. We're told that every seven Adventist minister is to be a watchman in a special sense to the house of God that when he sees danger, tell me, what does a watchman do? Does a watchman just close his mouth and watch an enemy intrude and say nothing about it? Why, he wouldn't be a watchman. The only thing, what, what good is a watchdog that can't bark? Why, there's only one thing to do with a watchdog. Take him out. Take him out. He can't be a watchdog and bark and not bark. Now, my brothers and sisters, if we're to be watchmen, if danger is in the church, the watchmen should give the trumpet a certain sound. It says, Son of man. It says, Son of man, I made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word, word at my mouth. That means that the watchman has to get close to Jesus. And instead of playing games, he has to be up, up at night talking to Jesus, early in the morning, waking up a great while before day, listening to the voice of sweet Jesus. It says, at my mouth, and give them, what's the next word? Not jokes, not stories. Give them warning from me. Give them a warning. Our message is a warning message, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, verse 18, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest them not warning nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way. What's the objective of the warning? Is the objective of the warning condemnation? Yes or no? No. What does it say? It says you give them warning to do what? To save his life. The objective of God's end time warning message is not condemnation but salvation. But we cannot be saved in sin. Call his name Jesus for Jesus will save us not in sin but what? From sin. The greatest work in the world today is the one of men that will not be bought or sold. The one of men that are true and honest in their inmost life. The one of men that are true to duty as the needle is to the pole. You know how the needle is in the compass? You can turn to the left, but the needle is still pointing north. You can turn to the south, but the needle points north. You can turn to the east, but the needle points north. We just be that way. No matter where we are, we point to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It says the word of the truth of duty as the needle to the bow. We should not be afraid to call sin by its right name. The Bible says to save his life. The same wicked man shall do what? So if he's warned and he still continues to live in sin, the Bible says he shall die in his iniquity. But then the Bible says what? But. So if you tell the wicked, there's a standard in diet. There's a standard in dress. There's a standard in music. There's a standard in worship. There's a standard in how we live. And if the wicked say, well, yes, I know, but I'm going to still do what I want, the watchman has done his job. If the church who has heard that God does not accept the drums of the world inside of God's church, and we've showed you from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, I don't care what man says when we leave, if it's different than the word of God, the Bible says, let him be accursed. That's Galatians. The Bible says that if this takes place, that, 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 that if we are lost in the sin, that even though we were told the truth, if we don't change, the Bible says that the minister is free because no blood will be on his hand if he tells the truth. Do you know that we're told that ministers are going to be judged ten times harder than the common people? Do you know there's no joke to stand behind this pulpit? That's why I will never ascend this pulpit without going to my knees and saying, have mercy upon me, O oh God. I'm not right to stand before that desk. Please cleanse me and purge me. I'm not back there playing around. I'm playing, please, God, I'm just a feeble, fickle man. Use me as your minister. 
is too much foolishness that has entered the ministry today. And God does not accept it. The Bible says that there is blood will I require at thine hand. Do you know that if you don't tell the truth, Jesus is going to hold it on the minister. You think you're getting a paycheck. You're going to close your mouth and not preach the trumpet because you think you're going to lose your job. Well, you will lose your soul. Verse 19 says, Yet if thou run the wicked, well, what if they don't listen? And he nor from his wicked word, he shall die in his iniquity. Both times the sinner dies if he doesn't turn to Jesus. But it goes on. Thou has what? Delivered thy soul. I'm going to tell you something. I have too much sin in my life that I had to deal with with Jesus than to have your blood on my hand. I'm going to give you the truth. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration says, no mortal eye but that of the high priest was to look upon the what? Inner apartment of the sanctuary. What, what apartment is that? What is that? That's the what? Most holy place. When was the day that he went into that most holy place? Tenth day of the what? Seven months. It was the end, it was the day of we studied this. Only once a year could the priest enter there, and that after the most careful and solemn what? Do you know that the priest could not just walk into the most holy place on the day of atonement that ten days prior to the day of atonement a trumpet was blown and they had ten days to get ready. You'll notice ten days is very special. How long did the disciples have to get ready for Pentecost? Ten days. You'll find that this ten day period is the period of preparation and God ten days prior to the day of atonement the feast of trumpets started saying blow the trumpet, get ready, the day of judgment is coming, get ready, get ready. Ten days before they start throwing away big screen televisions that were playing the filth of the world. They got rid of it. Priests start cleaning the house. Do you know that seven days before the priests and all the rest began to start going through purgings and cleansing, making sure there was nothing in their homes, nothing in their hearts, nothing in their life that would cause them to have sin unnoticed. And do you know, brothers and sisters, that the night, the, the week before the day of atonement, the priest moved out of his house and didn't even stay with his family. The night before, the priest did not even go to sleep for fear that somebody would touch him in the night. He not know it, be defiled, go into the most holy place, and be lost. It was a careful preparation. It really said that after the most careful and solemn preparation, with trembling, he went in before God on the day of atonement, and the people in reverential were there playing drums and jumping up and down and singing and shouting and swinging and celebrating, not on the day of atonement. They may have danced around the golden calf. They may have had the steel drum around the golden calf. They may have had the bass guitar. They may have had all this other music of the world, but not in the day of atonement. It said that in reverential silence, they awaited his return. They knew the text in Obeka that said, Be the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep what? Silence. Their hearts uplifted in earnest prayer for divine blessing. This is what we should be doing now. Lord, bless us. Bless the minister. Bless us all. It says, before the what? I'm so glad that even in the most holy place there was a mercy seat. What do you say? It said that before the mercy seat, the high priest made the atonement for Israel. And in the cloud of glory, God met with him. He stayed here in the most holy place beyond the accustomed time. Filled them with what? When that priest stayed in the most holy place longer than he should have. You know, there was a custom time. They knew the whole round. You know, the Jewish child by the age of 12, if you study the history of Josephus, talking about the Jewish child, he knew that the, the first five books of the Bible by the age of 12, every Jewish child from Genesis to Deuteronomy by memory. That meant Leviticus 16 was in the child's memory at the age of 12. What do we have in our mind at the age of 12? Rap songs and Jay-Z and Beyonce and all the Calypso and worldly music and all this. But do you know that the child by the age of 12 needs to have the Bible in his mind? We should be giving them the Bible. We're giving them Sesame Street. We're giving them Barney. How is Barney going to get them ready for this crisis? In fact, we have a Christian disguise. We give them Veggie Tales, but you don't know about Trinidad. You don't know about Veggie Tales in Trinidad. We give them Veggie No, listen. Is a cucumber with a Bible going to tell them to get ready? A carrot preparing a child for a crisis. 
It's a foolishness. Daniel wasn't given no carrot or a cucumber. Daniel was given the Bible. And as a result, in Babylonian captivity, Daniel stood. The three of the worthy stood because their parents gave them the Bible. See, when we get them a bunch of fairy tales, cucumbers walking around with Bibles, when they get old, they say that religion is just like that joke. It's not fake. It's not real. It's fake. It says, but he'll stay here behind the custom time and fill them with fear. They knew the custom time. They knew the priest was to do this and that. But my brothers and sisters, do you know the prophet says that, that when they thought that they were afraid for you know why? Because there's only two reasons why the priest would seem to stay longer in the most holy place. And it was all about sin. The first is because of their sins or what? His own sin. He had been slain by the glory of the Lord. But you and I know it was only one reason because Jesus was sinless. He's not going to be slain. Amen. Amen. Hebrews tells us that. So there's only one reason. What's the reason? Because of what? Their sins. That is, the sins of the congregation, our sins. Do you know that the only reason why Jesus has to linger even longer right now is because of our sins? But let me tell you something. God is merciful. He's long-suffering. But there is a limit. Did we prove that from the Bible? We proved from the spirit of prophecy. And I showed you that this generation, the limit is going to be reached. We have but a few short months at the most, brothers and sisters. What we have been learning for years, we'll have to learn in a few months. I think it's time for the truth. What do you say? We're going to stop right here and we're going to pray again and ask, dear God, we need Jesus. Now, it's amazing that some people, they come to church, you know where they want to get to church? They want to get fast food. They pass by Popeyes and Pat. You know, you remember Popeyes? Don't forget, every time you see it, think about Pope, yes, amen? Past Popeyes, past McDonald's, past all this other uh, fast food, but all the fast food is not out there. You know, the church has become a fast food. When as soon as 12.30 comes, everybody ready to go home. That's fast food. Fast food. Right? We can be in the club or in the world at work eight hours. At play hours. Children play video games four hours. You can't even send them to sleep. You let the child trick you. He goes to sleep at church and you can't go to sleep at home because he's awake. Ah. Right? If, if, if he can't let you sleep at home, I wouldn't let him sleep at church. You up at midnight, he keeping you up at midnight, and then at church he's sleeping. You say, no, no, that's supernatural. I wouldn't let it happen, brothers and sisters. Now, my brothers and sisters, the fast food is going on here, and it's almost like a fast, uh, what they call a high, ritzy restaurant. You go in, you dress up, you pay a lot of money, and all the restaurant gives you is a slice of cucumber, a tomato, some parsley to make you think you paid your money's worth. And then you leave out of the restaurant just as hungry as when you went in. You know, our churches are doing the same thing. You dress up just like you do at a fancy restaurant. You pay a lot of money in tithe and offering. And then you leave church just as hungry as when you came. I think we need more than fast food. What do you say? You want some strong meat today? You want to study today? Praise God. Would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Oh, come, let us kneel. Let us bow down before the Lord our maker. God deserves and is privileged to have our respect. I don't know how man can sometimes think that we cannot reverently kneel before a loving Jesus. Let us kneel. Let's speak for a few moments to Jesus. Let's forget the congregation and say, Lord, it's not my brother nor my sister, but it is me. And after a few moments of silent prayer, we'll get into the message. Get ready, get ready, get ready. O oh, Father in heaven, O oh, God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, O oh, God of the remnant church, let it be known today that thou art God in Israel, that thou art the God of the seven heavens church, that you are the true head, and you said that the gates of hell will not prevail upon this church. 
I pray, pray that it will be known today that I am your messenger and that this is your message. I pray, dear God, that you will give evidence by sending the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to make it evident that this is not man, but that God has endorsed this message so that we can see that we're not fighting with men, but we're fighting with God. That the mere common fishermen that were not trained in the rabbinical schools, that they had the credentials of heaven, while those that were trained in the rabbinical schools had rejected the Lord of glory. I plead that today that you will help us to, to sense the presence of the living God. That you will send the spirit and power of Elijah to bring us not condemnation, but salvation. To bring us education. To bring us revival and reformation. But Lord, we can do nothing without Jesus. Lord, I am a weak, fickle, feeble, frail, ignorant man. Give me your wisdom. Give me your love. Give me your truth. Give me what needs to be done today in this little time that we're together. Lord, please take full control. Escort the devil and his angels out and may Jesus walk in, in this room and angels up and every down this pew do something that will make hell tremble but will make heaven happy. For we ask this for us in the congregation. Pour your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible to the book of Revelation chapter 12. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. As we have studied the word of God, we have found that the great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward now in 2015 for nearly 6,000 years is about to end. Do we prove this? We have found, brothers and sisters, that Satan's attack on this generation is greater than on any other generation. Why? Because the devil knows this is not the first generation, but that this is what? The final generation. And I'm telling you, Satan is using everything in this generation. In Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Would you share your Bible with the young person? There's a young man beside you. Let him read it with you, please. Revelation 12, beginning in verse 12. You can read. You want your child and adults to look on what the Bible. Let's lead our children to the Bible. Amen? If that child's beside you, show him the Bible. Show it to him. This is the work of a parent. Revelation 12. And let me tell you something. Listen. Do you know that we cannot, cannot think that we're being faithful as ministers or elders if we come to church without Bibles? My brothers, I never forget, we were going to a funeral one time. It was a, a, a close friend of ours. One of their family members died, and they, they were not in the church. They, they, they were a, a member of the Baptist church, and so we went there just to, uh, with the family, and, and as we were there, we had our Bibles. Most of the people didn't have their Bibles, and the minister started doing the eulogy. He did the eulogy. He got about midway through the eulogy, and then he quoted a text. And he said, that text came from Psalms 25, 29. And I thought to myself, something sounds strange about that. Then he went on with the text. And everybody said, Amen to the text. I said, Wait a minute, this is something strange. I went to my Bible. There is no Psalms 25, 29. I flipped around. You, you don't have a text like that in the Bible. And I thought to myself, How many people are saying Amen to things not in the Bible? This is what I tell you bring your Bible. Make sure that everything is said is from the Word of God. Are you with me? My brothers and sisters, if there's only one Bible, there should be only one church. But the fact there's so many different denominations is proof of the fact that we listen to the testimony of men more than the testimony of the scriptures. The Bible tells us we must study the Bible for ourselves. Revelation 12, beginning in verse 12. Look at what it says. It says, Therefore do what? Rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the what? 
and of the Red Sea. Why? For the devil is come down into you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a what? That tells us that the devil, as he understands he can't attack heaven, he must attack earth. Woe to them to live. Why? The devil has come, and the Bible says he knows. If he's not guessing about this, the Bible says he what? He knows that he has, but in a short time it's amazing. The devil is so tricky. I told you it was tricky. Now I tell you it was tricky. The devil is tricky. He'll make a man think that what he needs in the winter time is an air condition, and what he needs in the summer is a heater. And I told you before, in Trinidad, if the devil can make you think you need a heater, you know you've been tricked. This is what he's doing right now. The Bible tells us that the devil, do you know that everybody in the Bible that stood for God knew the time? Jesus knew the time. He preached about it. The early apostles knew the time. The apostle Paul said, and that knowing the time. Oh, the early church knew the time. And the old, even, listen, even the devil knows the time. But he makes us think that we can't know it. And the devil knows something. Look what the prophet says. The devil knows that there's just a little time left. You see, the devil sees that his time is short. And do you know he's using everything? He's using every form of media to get control of your mind. He's using the television. He's using the internet. He's using Instagram. He's using Facebook to keep your face out of this book. He's using Twitter. Tw tweet. Tw what is a tweet? You go around tweeting and we tweet foolishness. We go out to a restaurant, tweet. We put on a sweater, tweet. We change our socks, tweet. Who cares? The devil is distracting us by everything because he knows that his time is short. Look what the prophet said, Vine 1263, it says, What shall I say to do what? Not put us to sleep. I've been praying, God, put words in my mouth, bathed by the power of the Holy Spirit that will cut its way through your heart so that we and I will wake up. Somebody says you're rocking the boat. Oh, yes, I want to rock that boat so hard you fall out of the boat of carnal security into the sweet arms of Jesus. It says, what can I say to arouse the room of people of God? I was shown that dreadful scenes are before us. Satan and his angels are bringing all their power, not just upon the world, but upon what? Upon God's people. Someone says, well, if this is God's church and, it's, and God hasn't left it, then tell me, why is there so much apostasy? Listen, if you were in a church where there were no problems, it would show you it wasn't God's church. The devil doesn't attack a church that's not going to do nothing. The devil attacks a church that has a mission, and this is why the devil has attacked this church. And if you leave this church, you lost your mind. Where else can you go? The Bible says, this is the, he knows his time is short. Inspiration says, he knows... That if they sleep not forever, not to the coming of Jesus, but if they sleep what? And we prove that that's the passing of a national what? If they sleep a little longer, he is sure of them, for their destruction is certain. I warn all who profess the name of Christ to closely examine themselves. You know it's not enough just to look at everybody else. We've got to look at ourselves. We can't go around the church looking just at everybody else. There's enough sin in our own lives that we need to examine ourselves and get sin and bring it to Jesus. I want all who profess the name of Christ to closely examine themselves and make full and thorough confession of all their wrongs that they may go hand before judgment. You see what it says? It's clear that the recording angel may write pardon against their names. I don't know about you, but I want pardon beside my name. And I'm going to tell you something. I was praying last night. And I prayed for each one of you last night. I don't remember every name. I tried to look at every row, every face, and I prayed for all of us. And there was a face that the Lord put in my, man, my, in my mind last night. And God showed me something that nobody else knows right now in this room. God showed me about a person. I'm telling you something. We're in a critical time right now. We are playing church, and God knows about it. Just because you put on clothes doesn't mean that, 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 that you're all right. You don't fool Jesus. You know, this is what our young people are leaving the church. It's not because of the message. They're leaving it because of the hypocrisy of what they see in the church. They see their parents talking about God in church and their parents listening to the same filth outside of the church, looking at the same movies that the rest of and then come to church and put on some sanctimonious air. You can imagine they're in church, husband and wife, killing each other. Then they get the church jump out of the car and say, Happy Sabbath! And the child said, that's mom, that's dad. They were just killing each other. But we know how to put on the front, but it doesn't fool Jesus. 
My brothers and sisters, no title fool Jesus. Not pastor, not elder, not teacher, not parent, not seven Adventist. Jesus sees the heart. He can see. You know, when I was over one local church back uh, in, in, in America, do you know, brothers and sisters, there was a young man, 12 years old. He came to me, part of the members of the church. He said, Pastor, please pray for me. He said, I'm struggling with pornography. 12 years old. See, computer make it easy. You know how many ministers are struggling with pornography right now? You know how many teachers are struggling with pornography in schools, in churches? You know how many elders struggling with pornography all around? And they think that nobody else knows. But God knows. You think that nobody knows about your adultery or fornication and you sneak out in the corner. But in Trinidad, you can't hide. My brothers and sisters, Jesus can look into our hearts. And I'm going to tell you something. It's what you say. We better examine before that record angel records everything with terrible exactness. How shall we stand that moment of searching? My brothers and sisters, this says, my brother, my sister, if these precious moments of mercy are not improved, you will be left without excuse. Somebody will say, well, dear God, how come you didn't give me more time? How come you didn't give me more warnings? How didn't you save me? Jesus said, what do you mean? I gave you a whole week to study the Bible, but you were too busy with work. You were too busy with school. You were too busy with play. I gave you a whole time, but you stayed in the back somewhere hiding out. You stayed out there talking. You've been distracted. You've been moose. But my, my brothers and sisters, you will see that instead of a man, that an angel was standing beside the desk saying, please, get ready, get ready, get ready. Jesus is getting ready to come. God says that before the coming of the Lord that God is going to send messengers with a message still more pointed than that of John the Baptist. John the Baptist did not cower down because men who were in leadership position came up. John the Baptist looked at her and said, wait a minute, you are breaking the law of God. God says, where is Elijah? 450 prophets of Baal. God had a man that's going to be faithful. I want to be one of those men. What do you say? And every one of us can be one. We can be one as leaders. We can be one as laity. We can be one as pastors. We can be one as the common people. God is going to have a faithful few in leadership and in laity, but it's not going to be the many. My brothers and sisters, the devil wants to shut this church down by the passing of a national Sunday law. Go to Revelation chapter 12. Look now at verse 17. You see the devil has been attacking this church. Anybody know who that man is? Anybody know who that man is right there? Who was that man? Joe Cruz. Was he an offshoot or a seven Adventist? One of the greatest evangelists in recent times that is known. You know Joe Cruz came to Trinidad. You know that, don't you? Creeping compromise. Reaping the whirlwind. Enemy at the gate. He wrote all these books. You know, Joe Cruz had went all out the world, winning thousands to the Seventh Heaven's church. But when he started visiting his churches, he began to see that what he taught people not to do from the Bible in the world that they were practicing in his own church. And so he said, wait a minute, I've been writing all these tracts for the world. He wrote over 25 books for the world. He said, for, uh, bring evangelism. But he said, I got to write something for my church. Three books. Creep and Compromise. In this order. It's amazing that every book that he wrote in the first two had to be changed right now. You know, when a, when a baby is, is barely stumbling, you say that baby's creeping. Is that right? The compromise in our church is no longer creeping. It's running. Next book, Enemy at the Gate. You know, when he wrote it, it was at the gate. But not today. The enemy is in the gate. The only book that you can keep the same is Reaping the Whirlwind because right now that's what we're doing. We have sown to the wind and now we are reaping the... Before we were ever born, our church lowered the standards. God is raising us up in the last generation to bring about a revival and a reformation based on the words of the living God. And this is why the devil is attacking this church. Revelation 12 verse 17 tells us that the devil would attack the church. You don't have to be afraid of what's happening. This is prophesied. Revelation 12 verse 17, the Bible says, and the dragon, who's the dragon? The devil, Satan, was wroth with the woman and went to make what? War with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And last night, we proved that that is the spirit of what? 
this church, you know, the, I'm going to read a page from his book, Reaping the World, on page 57. Look what the prophet says, because right now today, you know what we've been told, just what Joe Cruz was told 20 years ago, you know, he had a message on the radio, written thousands, but they say, you know what, you can't keep preaching like that because you're scaring people away. He's bringing in thousands. It says, surely the time has come for every seven at Venice to learn about the sins of what? Does the Bible teach that in Revelation 3? Now, if you study Revelation 3, you will find that every church up into seven, God follows a format if you study the seven churches. Jesus identifies himself first. Then he talks about those things that are good with the church, gives them commendation, encouragement, and then he tells them those things that are bad in the church, and then he reminds them who he is, and then he gives them encouragement that they can overcome. He does that in every church except for the sixth and seventh. Six, no problems, only encouragement. And the seventh, you know that he, he identifies himself, but he gives no encouragement the way you think you get encouragement. He doesn't commend him anything. You know what he does? He starts off with giving the, you know, we're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And when you understand that, somebody says, well, well, we're not preaching like Jesus. But Jesus is the one who gave the message to the church. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and what? Now this says, you know, we're told, brothers and sisters, it says, it says, it, it says, the, 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 about the sins of the Lord, see, it's world and it's pride, and to join with those who will cry out against the nauseating mixture of flesh and spirit. Ministers and members must be willing to risk what? Criticism in order to preach the Lord, see, a message. There are a thousand more pleasant subjects. You know, I can tell you before I go, so you can say, oh, I love that minister, but I got to tell you the truth before I leave. Amen. Amen. Is that what you want? Yes. Praise God. There are a thousand more pleasant subjects. But the hour is too late to substitute smooth things. Neither do the sleeping saints need more soothing messages. This is the hour not for going to sleep. This is the hour for what? Waking up. It is now high time to awake out of sleep. Romans 13 verse 11. Why? The devil is rough with this church. Does the Bible say that? The devil is attacking this church. My brothers and sisters, you must understand, you must know why. Why is the devil attacking this church? The devil knows, brothers and sisters, that he has a period of time. The devil knows that Jesus had three phases of his ministry before he finished the work and crushed the serpent's head. He knows there was a work in the outer court, there was a work in the holy place, and a work in the what? Now I want to ask you a question. Did Jesus win in the outer court, yes or no? He said it's finished. He finished the work as a lamb. Not the plan of redemption, but he finished the work as a lamb and then began the second phase of the plan of redemption in the holy place. Did he win in the holy place, yes or no? Yes. And the devil knows three strikes and you are out. And so the devil says if he beats me on the third strike, my head is crushed. So he tried to stop him in the holy place. And do you know what he did in the holy place? The devil, he tried to, no, 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 go back. let me show you something one time for a moment. It's what it says that the first thing, when the moment that Jesus was born, the devil tried to kill Jesus before he was ever born. Is that right? He never wanted Jesus to even live because he knew that Jesus was going to destroy him. The Bible knew that he was afraid of Jesus. Everywhere he went, Jesus beat him up. The Bible says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. The devil fears and trembles to meet Jesus face to face. We have a mighty Savior. What do you say? But now my brothers and sisters, he failed in the outer court. Jesus died. And oh, you see he's afraid, but it's all right. He failed at the cross, the devil. Am I right? But then phase two took place. What was the next thing the devil did? The devil, after he saw Jesus win the early apostles, they began to start fulfilling with the Holy Spirit. They were now common fishermen, but they went from east to west, and one generation carried the gospel to the entire world, and the devil got afraid of them, and so he said, I must, if I can't beat them from the outside, I've got to join them. He tried to burn them at the stake, but the, 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 the reformer was singing when he was burning at the stake. He was singing, not these old choruses that have no meaning. You know, it's almost like those old, you know, the rock, rock and roll songs and all this new song, they have no meaning. They repeat the same words over and over again. No message. It's almost like the old rock and roll song, wop, baba, loop, wop, bip, bamboo. What'd you say? You said nothing. You're bringing it to the church and the chorus just saying the same thing over and over again, but it has no message. You see, you couldn't go to the stake with a message talking about we won't stop. How are they going to take you through the stake? How are you going to go through these contemporary songs? We sing a song that like, like, like Jesus is our lover. Oh, I love you and miss you. Look, no, mama, listen to me, brothers and sisters. 
the hymn songs have a message. A mighty fortress is my God. A bulwark never failing. Our mighty help, Mr. Flood, he's our mighty helper. Didn't want my brothers and sisters a shelter in the time of what? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. I'm pressing on the upper way. New heights I'm gaining every day. But because we stop raising the standard, we stop singing the songs. These songs took us to this state. Read the history of Huss and Jerome. And you'll read Huss when they said, are you afraid to stand? He said, if I was afraid, I wouldn't be here today. I'm going to tell you the truth. And with the flames, they got ready to put it behind his back. He said, no, if I was afraid, I wouldn't be here standing today. Come in front of me. They lit the flame. And as they lit the flame, Huss began to sing, Jesus uh, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus, the son of David, have mercy. And the flames burned through him, but he was not afraid to die for Jesus. You see, when you know Jesus as a friend, you're not afraid of coming persecution. If you are afraid, it simply shows that we don't know who Jesus is. But I'm going to tell you something. If you don't know Jesus and you're still not afraid, you are a fool. How can you not know Jesus and not be afraid? The Bible says in Isaiah 33 that hypocrite, verse 16 says, hypocrite, that, that fearfulness will surprise the hypocrite. If you're playing church, you should be afraid. But when you love Jesus, perfect love casteth out all fear. But if you love the world, there's no room for the love of Jesus. If we're in love with worldly music, worldly dress, worldly diet, worldly education, worldly everything, the Bible says, love not the world, for if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love the world and Jesus. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. And it's amazing. We can give the devil 16 hours of our day. We give him 16 hours of the day. We give the world 16 hours of our day. And we give Jesus not even 30 minutes of quality time and think that we're developing a friendship with Jesus. Look at what we do every day. We wake up in the morning, barely spend any time with him. Not even 10 minutes in prayer. We rush into work, rush into school, rush into play. We might stop for lunch and then not even another minute. We pray that little prayer. Thank you for the food so sweet. Thank you for the bird so sweet. Thank you for the food. We, we, not even a minute. Then we go back to work, school, play. Go back home. We rush home. We get back. We're tired. We got to look at the news. We got to jump on Facebook. We got to see what's up. What's up? We do all that. Then when we have done all of that and gotten all out of the way, then we say, oh, yes, let's come together, family, if we do that. And maybe for another minute, we talk to God, fall asleep on the knees, wake up three hours later and say, honey, I was praying for three hours. No, you were sleeping for two hours, 59 minutes. You were praying for one moment. And we fell asleep upon our knees. That wasn't even 30 minutes a day. We do that seven days a week, four weeks out of the month, 12 months out of the year, and think we're getting ready to meet Jesus. The devil has tricked us. And in the holy place, those reformers rose up, but he rose up the Antichrist that said that there's a priesthood on earth. You don't need to look to the priesthood in heaven. It was Antichrist. They tried to stop us from going to Jesus in the holy place. But Martin Luther and the Reformation rose up and said, wait a minute. God called us back away from priests and popes. We must live by the word of God. God is the one who we can trust in our salvation for. And this made Jesus have the victory in the holy place. And God rose up the Reformation. But then in 1844, Jesus moved from the holy to the what? Satan says, I have one more chance. In the most holy place, he said, if I can't stop here, three strikes and you are what? Out. And everything he has is trying to destroy seven Adventists. Has he gotten into our church, yes or no? Yes. Is it still God's church, yes or no? Yes. yes. Now, my brothers and sisters, the devil is doing everything. You know what this is right here? Anybody know what this building is right here? This building is the headquarters of the Seventh Day Adventist Church in Silver Springs, Maryland. A few months back, I was there doing meetings. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, this is the prophet, Satan's chief work is at the headquarters of our what? Of our faith. He spares no pains to corrupt men in what? See, the devil knows that if he can attack the head, then he can affect the what? Body. He wants to destroy the whole body of Seventh Day Adventists that nobody, nobody will be prepared to crush his head. And so he says, I've got to stop this body, this remnant body. And so he says, if I can just get to their head, I can stop their body. And so he says, the headquarters, I'm, this is the prophet, the headquarters of our faith affect the what? Whole body of believers. 
This is what the prophet goes on to say. This is coming from uh, volume 4 of the testimony. You can't see it, but it's coming from volume 4 of the testimonies, 2, 10 and 2, 11. It says, the, the heart, uh, it says, if the heart of the word becomes what? Corrupt. If the devil can get into the general conference and can get people in there, that everybody doesn't believe what God says. You know, there are some faithful people from the top to the bottom. I praise God for the John Conference president. What do you say? He's been calling us back to the Bible, back to the three angels, back to the spirit prophecy, back to the message. He said, away from spiritual formation, away from contemplative prayer that has entered our schools. He said, away from all this that came from Jesuitism and the world. He said, away. Yes, but it says that the heart becomes corrupt. It says the whole church in its various branches and interests scattered abroad and it goes on to say it's gone off the face of the earth it says will suffer in consequences this is volume 4 2 10 2 11 i don't make any words up i'm just reading it says it is satan's plan to to, to, to cause uh, to, to, to cause weaken the faith of god's people in the testimonies number one next follows skepticism and the vital pill points of, or pillars of our position then doubt as to the scriptures and then the downward march to perdition the prophet says in that order there's the four steps first we get rid of the spirit of prophecy then we begin to start doubting the pillars the three angels sanctuary revelation 14 we begin to doubt what god said about the sabbath and the standards and health reform and education reform we give it up it says that then then doubt as to the scriptures and then the downward must be this. I'm going to tell you in 2015 we're already between three and four right now. We have university today where many professors don't even believe in the first 11 books of the Bible. We have today universities where they're teaching today. I've been to them. I was just a few weeks ago in Loma Linda and La Sierra where they're teaching so-called natural evolution. How can a seven day Adventist teach in natural evolution? We have left the Spirit of God, and God says we've got to come back. Elijah must come and say, how long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, then serve him. But if Baal, then serve him. We cannot be seven evidence in worldliness. Now, I don't need you to say yes. I want you to listen. Now, look what this says. Satan has attacked us. The prophet says there will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, which is what? Do you know that's the first step? We're going to find out that the very last deception of Satan. You see, when we as leaders and members begin to reject the spirit of prophecy, we reject the commandments and the word of God. I proved that last night from the Bible. Did I not? We looked at many texts. It says, brothers and sisters, now is that in the Bible? It says, there's a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. Is that in the Bible? Where? We just read it. Revelation 12 says, and the dragon. Who's the dragon? That's Satan. It says it's wrath. What does wrath mean? Hatred. And it says he's wrath with those who have not only the commandments of God, but those that have the what? And the testimony of Jesus is what? So the Bible says that Satan will be wrath with the spirit of prophecy in the last days, and he would use that to attack the church. Go to Hosea. What book did I say? You see, this is one of our basic problems. The Bible says to the law and to the testimony. Hosea chapter 13. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Inspiration tells us one thing is certain. Those seven Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimony of God's Spirit. And I want you to hear me. Hear me clear today. Hear me clear today. I don't care who we are from the last pew member of the seven Adventist church to the top. I say it respectfully. If we reject the spirit of prophecy that was manifested in the writings of Sister Ellen G. White, the prophet says clearly that those seven Adventists will take their stand under Satan's banner, which is the mark of the beast. If you see a leader or a laity that will reject the spirit of prophecy, you are finding out that you're getting ready to receive the mark of the beast. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. The prophet says it, but I'm not afraid to say what the prophet said. Now, this says they will first give up their faith and the warnings and reproofs contained and the testimony of God's spirit. Now, somebody will have to say, why? Listen to me. Listen, somebody said, I thought we were saved by the blood of Jesus. We are. There is no other name. We showed you last night. There is no other name given other than under heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of what? But I want to ask you a question. What is the spirit of prophecy? Is it the testimony of Sister White? I know what the Bible says. The Bible calls the spirit of prophecy the testimony of what? How can you reject the testimony of Jesus and say we love Jesus? 
Jesus said in Luke 6, why call you me Lord, Lord, and will do not the things which I say? Now, my brothers and sisters, who told us that the spirit of prophecy was coming. The Bible says in the last days I will pour out my spirit. The Bible says that in Revelation 12 that God's church would not only have the commandments of God, but if you're the remnant church, we would have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. The Bible told us this. Now, when did we get the spirit of prophecy? You know, the early church, when Jesus went up to heaven, he gave gifts unto men. Is that right? Ephesians 4 says that when Jesus ascended on high, verse 8 through 14, that when Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men. He gave some pastors, some apostles, some prophets. It is the gift of prophecy. He gave us the gift of prophecy. Now, that gift of prophecy is the spirit of prophecy. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. If a woman today in this room we're getting ready to receive some gift from some man that was getting ready to become her husband, say some flower, some lily, or some other hibiscus that we have in the Caribbean. Amen. Some beautiful flower. And all of a sudden, she gives it to him, and he says, I love you. He gives the flower. And she takes the flower and does like this. She takes the flower and she does like this. Would you say, yes, she loves him? Would you say that? The way we treat the gift demonstrates what we think about the giver of the gift. And if Jesus died on the cross and gave us the gift or the spirit of prophecy and we reject the gift of Jesus, it shows us that we don't love Jesus. And the reason why we will be lost is because we don't love Jesus. But you can't love Jesus and hate the testimony of Jesus. Hosea 12, verse 13. Notice what the Bible says. Hosea 12, verse 13 says, And by a what? By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet, was he what? So God brought ancient Israel out by a prophet, preserved Israel by a prophet, and all these things happen for in samples upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that means in modern Israel, God would have a prophet to bring us out of Egypt, and God would have a prophet to preserve modern Israel in this last generation. Who is that prophet? That prophet is Sister Ellen G. White. Moses died before he got in the promised land. Sister White died before she got in the promised land. We studied this from the Bible. My brothers and sisters, when you look at what the Bible says, if you take preservatives out of the food, what happens to the food? It gets what? And if you take the spirit of prophecy out of the remnant church, what's going to happen to the church? It will be spoiled right on. And what has happened to us in 2015? Our publishing house has been spoiled. But Review and Herald is gone today. Our schools have been spoiled. Our university is spoiled. Our homes have been spoiled. Our churches have been spoiled. And somebody says, well, God is going to give it up and start something new. Oh, no, 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 no. Jesus says, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring a revival and a reformation. Now, everybody's not going to do it. You know, we're told that over 99% of leaders and laity are going to be shaken out of the church. I proved that from the Bible Spirit Prophecy this week. There's only going to be a few, a small number. That's the saddest thing in the Bible, that from Genesis to Revelation, when you study sacred history, that the majority of God's people have never been ready for a religious crisis. We're told, brothers and sisters, that the very last deception of Satan would be to make another effect. And if you go anywhere in the world, you see all these problems. I've gone from continent to continent during these meetings, country to country during these meetings. And do you know that the condition of the church is the same in every place, showing us that it's not man, but the devil has made a worldwide attack on our church because he knows that if our church wakes up, he's in trouble. Someone says, oh, no, our church is not an attack. We read this. And it says that Satan would change our religion. It says our religion would be what? First, second message, 12, 4, 12, 5. We already read this. Saying we'll bring a counterfeit reformation. And he would give a symbol to let us know that the counterfeit reformation was brought in. I showed you this week that that symbol did not come from the most holy place. I showed you that that symbol, even though this is God's church, if you study the Bible, and I can show you from the Bible, and the Bible, do you know in the Israel nation, they changed Israel's symbol before they went into apostasy. The Bible says that. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is still God's church, but we see not our signs. The abomination of desolation. Before the abomination of desolation, the devil set up his sign in Jerusalem. Before the abomination of desolation. And my brothers and sisters, the abomination of desolation takes place when the national Sunday law is passed. 
So our sign will be changed just prior to the passing of a national Sunday law. Why? Because the devil is afraid of God's church. We are a sleeping giant. This is the real symbol. This is the biblical symbol. And if you remember, were there anybody in this room that's been in this church for 50 years? Anybody been in seven minutes 50 years? Let me see your hand. Was this a symbol when you came in this church? This was a symbol. I said it before, somebody said, oh no, that's not true. That's not the house symbol. I said, well, history. You, can't, you may not like history, but you can't deny history. Study your history. Know your history. This is history. Published continually since what? 1841. What symbol do you see? Now, I studied when this happened. 1995. I preached in this 1995. I know what happened. I know why it happened. It's you. You should be saying, why did this happen? When did this happen? And I told you before, if you ask me hard enough, I might tell you. Amen? Some of you might know. Let's continue. Watch now. I told you this man came into the church and God brought him in. And when he came in, first thing he preached, get back to the Bible. Back to the three angels. Back to the spirit prophecy. Back and everybody hated. Do you know that on the ground, they tried to put him out of office the moment he got into office. And let me tell you, 2015, this is going to be a serious year. We think it's about women's ordination. I hope I have enough time right now to show you. Women's, women's ordination is just a smoke screen. You better understand some brothers and sisters, the devil is attacking this church from center to a circumference. And there has been a change in the church and this sign shows us our religion has been changed. But God brought this man in, but in 2015, guess what? A new president is elected every five years. You better pray, brothers and sisters. We are going to see a shaking in just a few short months in 2015 at the general conference session in Texas. You better get ready, get ready, get ready, brothers and sisters. And you think I'm not going to tell you the truth? You think I'm going to puff it down and give you milk? You've got the wrong man to tell you that. Jesus said, get ready, brothers and sisters. What we need is not a new church. Revival Reformation, we've been robbed. 18 million, seven Adventists have been robbed of the greatest wealth of truth that God has ever given to mortals. You don't know what we have. When you know what a seven Adventist is, you'll walk not with your head down. You will know that you're a representative of Jesus. My brothers and sisters, as Raisin says, we are in the great day of atonement when our sins by confession and repentance are to go beforehand to judgment. God does not now accept a what? You see, you don't mind a lion when you can tame him. When you can take a minister and tame him and make him say whatever you want him to say, you, you let that minister talk anywhere, but you're afraid of a minister you can't tame. It says that God does not now accept a tame, spiritless testimony from his ministers. Why? Such a testimony would not be present truth. Now, a man may accept it. A leader may accept it. A church may accept it. But God will not accept it. It says the message for this time must be meat in due season to feed the church of God. But Satan has been seeking not all at once, but what? Gradually, generation by generation. To rob this mess of his power that the people may not be prepared to stand. That's the issue. Or are you going to stand in defense of the faith that was once delivered to the saints? Or are you going to be afraid and compromise when this message is over? When this leaves here, and I'm going to tell you something. After my departure, grievous wolves are going to enter in. They may not even wait for me to leave. But if they do it while I'm here, I'm going to slay a wolf. Amen. Praise God. The Bible says Phineas stood up and took his javelin and slayed apostasy with the word of God. Jesus himself went into the temple. They were acting fools. That I can imagine them having drums in the temple. Them having the steel drum in the temple. Them having all the other foolishness and selling in the temple. And Jesus came in, took some cords, and cleansed that temple out. That young Galilean with no earthly degree or badge stood unmoved by the adultery and adultery of the foolishness of the world. He stood for Jesus. He was the man of God. And I want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says we must be prepared to stand. As Raisin tells us that these symbols are in every other church. You don't know, study history. The only place where you see this flame is not in the most holy place like that. You see it where? It is designed to take us out of the most holy place because it's in the most holy place that we stand. It's in the most holy place that there's changing in how we eat and drink and dress and educate and live because on the 10th day of the seventh month, everything changes there. The devil wants to take us there, but in the most holy place, in the most holy place, Jesus prepares us to do what? Stand. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the message. We have been robbed of this message. It's been taken from you, and you are proud to wear a flame.
Someone says, no, the whole religion hasn't been changed. Yes, it has. I'm going to take some time and tell you. You want me to tell you the truth, yes or no? I quote from, this is the Review and Herald, Review and Herald, November 8, 2001. You know that man is right there? That man is B.B. Beach. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. You know that man right there? He was the previous pope. Quote, I quote from the Review and Herald, Beach's encounter with the Roman pontiff came as a member of the Christian world communication following a special luncheon at the Vatican. Note, the Seventh Adventist Church is not a member. Praise God. It is Beach, uh, some, excuse me, Seventh Adventist Church is the member, excuse me, not Beach individually. Amen. We want to understand. I'm not attacking him. I'm showing you what the review says. Beach was representing the what? Now I want to ask you a question. What does the prophet say about this? It is a what? Backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the what? I think that that's too close. What do you say? Now, the Bible says that the third angel teaches, the third angel says that if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark and his four in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. That's the third angel. The second angel said Babylon is what? Fallen. Does the three angels tell us to have lunch with the Vatican? And my brothers and sisters, this is God's church. Don't misunderstand me. This is God's church, but we're saying that the devil has made war upon the church. God is to prepare, as we're told, that this is the purpose of our schools. God is to prepare, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to prepare people to stand. True to them during the investigative judgment. This is why we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitarium. Everything is to prepare us for this time. Let me go on. We restate this already. The person tells us, you know this man right here, same person. Watch this now. Look what the prophet says. Protestants have what? Tampered with and patronized popery. They have made compromises and concessions which papists themselves are what? Surprised to see and fail. The papal church can't even understand it. I mean, look. Here's the pope. There's the seven of Adventists. Look at the priest right here. Look at him. He's looking. Look at his face. He's saying, is that a seven-day Adventist? Look at him. He even he's surprised. He said, I thought they told we were the beast. It says they are surprised to see and fail to understand. Men are doing what? Closing their eyes. Watch his eyes. They're closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism. Let me tell you something. In, to in Trinidad and Tobago, you're closing your eyes. I showed you what your government has already said about the Vatican. And the danger should be apprehended for our supremacy. The people need not to be put to sleep, but the people need to be what? Aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to what else? Civil and what? Do you know that Trinidad does not know the danger of civil liberty? They don't know that this Pope that they're honoring, this Vatican they're honoring, is getting ready to cause your liberty, civil and religiousness, to be removed. And the seven Adventist church is to wake up and show this. To wake up and show this. I believe it's time to set our house in order. What do you say? Yeah. This reason tells us. Let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message which is present true for this time. Show the people where we are in, pro in prophetic history. Seek to arouse a spirit of true what? That we're supposed to be Protestants. But by, we're no longer protesting. Here's a paper that we wrote, Adventist Church, a minister of the Seventh Adventist Church, wrote this in our article, and it says, letting Roman Catholics what? Seven reasons for rethinking our enemies list. This pastor in one of our churches in the States, he actually got up and said, he, it says, for over a century, even before the publication of the Great Controversy, we Adventists regard Roman Catholic Church leadership typified in the first beast of Revelation 13 as our arch enemies, the enemy that takes the evil part in the apocalyptic scenario of God's remnant. We did that because the Bible says that. Then it says, here are seven reasons why it may be time to question them in that role. That minister's credential should have been revoked the moment this was published. How can you be a minister of the three angels' messages and one of which teaches that the third angel is to warn against the beast and his image and his mark and you're not willing to preach the truth of the everlasting gospel? It says, he said, Ellen White figured Catholicism in a very different world. Historians have shown the 19th century American anti-Catholicism grew out, they didn't say not of the Bible, but grew out of a general anti-immigrant nativism. In an era when we have had a, uh, and could have, again, a liberty-loving Roman Catholic president, when Catholic immigrants are becoming our young workforce, why can't we preach the what? Without identifying who? 
Now, how can you preach the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14, and it says that one of it is to identify the beast, his image, and his mark. All need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity. This is the papacy. He has called them, his people, not to have lunch with them, but to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. I'll never forget one time, many, many years ago, we were doing a meeting somewhere in another island, and as we were doing the meetings, I was preparing the message. I put the man of sin, the Pope, on my uh, slide to show something, and my daughter was walking by, and as my daughter walked by, you know what took place? She went by, and she said, Daddy, look, the man of sin. I said, yes, daughter. Protestants. Is that Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. In these countries where Catholicism is now in the ascendancy and the papists are taking a consensus of course to gain influence, there is an increasing indifference concerning the doctrines that separate the reformed churches from the papal hierarchy. The opinion is gaining ground that after all, we do not differ so widely upon vital points as has been supposed and that a little concession on the part of Protestants, our part, will bring us into a better understanding with Rome. The time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience, which has been so dearly purchased. They taught their children to uphold Pope and we given them veggie tales. And held that to seek harmony with Rome will be disloyalty to God. But how widely different are the sentiments now expressed? It's time to set our house in order. Our religion has been changed. This right here says, it may be astonishing, but in 1977, the General Conference of Santa Venice presented a gold medallion to the Pope as an expression of our close friendship with the Papal States. Our religion has been changed. Now, how could we have lunch? How could we be saying that our doctrine is no different? How could we do this and change our logo unless our religion has been what? This is the man who used to be the uh, Secretary of Education for the General Conference. He said that our higher education is in trouble. I didn't just say it. The man is over the education, brought it out. He's saying that we are in trouble because there's so much lowering down of seven evidence standards. He's in a General Conference. said the same thing. Here's an old, you, you know what Falkenberg was? You know what Falkenberg was? Falkenberg had encouraging words for seven evidence ministers who gathered from throughout the United States for the annual conference here, but also he had some stinging words for some, especially for what? Seven Adventists. Adventist college professors who said are straying from the what? Don't get mad at me. Your president, your former president said that our colleges are straying. Our schools and churches are straying, and he himself was straying. Now it says one challenge we are facing as seven day Adventists is substituting our what? opinion for God's opinion as if our opinion had any eternal value. What do you care? What does we care about what you think about music or what you think about diet or what you think about dress? There's a way that seems right, but my brothers and sisters, what does the Bible say? Folkenberg said, God doesn't care what you think. There has been a tendency to re redefine God's word in their own terms, and our church has not been spared that kind of assault. We have too many preachers and teachers infecting our faith with what? Relativism, that there is no absolute truth. But, but, but my brothers and sisters, the Bible is the infallible, authoritative, uh, uh, unchanging word of an infinite God. It's right. I don't care what man says. I don't care how long a man goes to school. I'm not going to let him make a monkey out of me. Professors who dare not even believe in the first what? He said there are professors in our schools that don't even believe in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. The story of the creation, they don't believe it. It's time for us to do what? That's no offshoot. That's the president of the General Conference, former... It's time for us to stand and be counted and boldly affirm our beliefs. All I'm doing is what the General Conference President said. Amen. Somebody says, well, who gives you authority to do this? God gives me authority to do this. Somebody says, where did you go to school? I went to the same school that Jesus went to. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, Falkenberg said that until recently, seven evidence have been immune to the struggles of other mainline Protestant denominations have encountered concerning struggles over the authority of the scriptures. We are about 10 years behind the others when it comes to the authority of the scriptures, he said, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. We are in the middle of it. This was in 1990s. In 2015, we are at the end of it. We are in the omega of apostasy. Brothers and sisters, the very last attack, everything that the devil has, He's pushing everything against the spirit of prophecy. 
That's the last attack. You see, if the devil can take out the spirit of prophecy, then he can make you believe whatever you want. See, when you have that spirit of prophecy, it tells you, no, 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 in plain language. Someone says, well, you don't know what the Hebrew says or the Greek says, praise God, the spirit of prophecy, you don't need Hebrew or Greek. The spirit of prophecy is to make it plain, brothers and sisters. Someone says, well, 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 she didn't know Hebrew or Greek, but I suppose the Holy Spirit does. And if the Holy Spirit knows it, then the Holy Spirit is going to give it just as he meant to give it. And if God didn't say what he meant in the spirit of prophecy, then why doesn't he say what he means? God says what he means, brothers and sisters. We're told Satan is constantly pressing in to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan. The very last. The very last. Not the last, but the what? Very last. The session of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God where there's no vision the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. This is happening right now. It's happening from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top. And the question is, where are you going to stand? If you believe that the Bible says what the Spirit prophecy says, and the Spirit prophecy says what the Bible says, if you believe this in the most holy place, you can become a servant at Venice. What do you say? Now listen to me. Does the Bible say this? Everything the prophet says. Go to 2 Chronicles 36. I know you're ready to go home. I got to get ready to wind down. 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 36. We're going to see that just before God's people went into Babylonian captivity, this was the very last thing. Before the, the, they worshiped and turned their back on the temple, worshiped the sun, as recorded in Ezekiel 8 and 9, when they had to be sealed for sighing and crying for all the abominations done in the land, we find this out, brothers and sisters. We find this out. We're going to 2 Chronicles 36. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 2 Chronicles 36, the Bible says, Beginning now, beginning now, 2 Chronicles 36, all these things happen for in samples and are written for our admonition upon whom the, verse 14, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 3, 14, let's read it together. This was the last part of Israel's history before they were taken out of Palestine, scattered and destroyed. 2 Chronicles 36, beginning in verse 14, it says, moreover, all the chief of the priests, tell me who they are, talk to me somebody. Now, that, that's Old Testament. I'm talking about in this generation. I'm talking to me because all this happened for us. Amen. Red Ryan Admonition. Who's the chief priest? Who talked to me? You afraid to talk? <laughs> this is the general leadership, the chief, not just the pastor, but this is over the pastor. This is in conference position. Just like Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the general conference president. Praise God that we don't have Caiaphas right now. I pray. Amen. And not only the leaders, though, you can't just turn your back or attack on the leaders. Look what it says. Not only the chief priests, but also the what? So it was a general apostasy. Transgress very much after all the what? We found out that the abomination and dress were in the church. You know, they were dressing. They were confusing the dress. We read it in Leviticus 18, Deuteronomy 22. The men were dressing like women and the women were dressing like men. They brought that abomination in. They brought the abomination of homosexuality in. They brought the abomination of the music of the pagans in to the church of God. And God said enough. That same drums we are told before the close of probation, all of the sins we exposed yesterday were in the church. And the Bible says it was still God's church. 2 Chronicles 36 goes on. It says, And polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem with his presence. This is presence. Verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his what? He couldn't use sometime the majority of the priests, so he had to get some self-supporting messengers. And he took this messenger, and what did the messengers do? It says, and the messengers rising up be times and sending because he wanted to destroy his church. Is that what it says? No, God's ministers are not trying to destroy the church. It says he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Do you know that no matter how much apostasy we're in, God loves us? The plan of redemption is to expose sin, not so that he can kill us, but so they can separate sin from the sinner, destroy the sin, and save the sinner. What do you say? This is the plan of redemption. God's not interested in dying. Jesus would never have went to the cross if he wanted us to die. I don't care how sinful you are tonight. I don't care what you're eating or drinking or dressing or wearing. Do you know that if you come to Jesus today, there's hope in coming to Jesus. There is still a mercy seat in the most holy place. Now, my brothers and sisters, he had compassion. On his people in the dwelling place, verse 16 says, but even though he had compassion, what did they do? They didn't listen to the messenger. They didn't take it serious. 
They mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, misused his what? So what was the last thing they did? They missed, used his what? Prophet. Did I say or did the Bible say that? Now this happened for an example upon whom the ends of the world are come. It says they missed, used his what? Prophets. And then what happened? God, was there a limit? Yes or no? Until the wrath of the Lord rose up against his people, until there was what? Nothing else that Jesus can do. The very last thing is going on right now. We are taking the spirit of prophecy, whatever it says, and we say, but. We don't care what it says. We don't what we want. But my brother and sister, you can't stand the most holy place. It is the duty of the congregation on the day of atonement to accept not only the law, but the prophets. Do you think that God is going to bring millions of people into this church in this condition? Do you know, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that our church is not going to remain in this apostate condition. The Bible says that even though we see problems in darkness, there is before our church the dawning of a bright and better day. The Bible says that this church is going to shake off its lethargy, its sins. It's going to start cleansing up with every spot or wrinkle. There's going to come a revival and reformation that has not been witnessed since apostolic times. God is going to send men like fishermen, like Elijah, to bring about revival and reformation. And it says the common people are going to wake up. They're going to throw off the straight jacket of tradition. They're going to throw off the straight jacket of custom. They're going to live by the Bible and the word of God. Instead of church manuals and creeds, they're going to live by the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And God is going to bring them up to their upright position. Revelation 18 says that this angel, Revelation 18, turn there. Revelation 18 pictures it. It says that I saw another angel come down from heaven. Having, as it says that this angel that came down from heaven, that he lightened the earth with his glory. He was the final messenger of light to give the world the glory of Jesus. Why? Because fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. The judgment of the living is coming when this angel is given that loud cry. Church has been shaken mightily. My brothers and sisters, then all the world is going to wish they were seven Adventists. At that time, Fox News, CNN, you all are a Trinidad Express. The whole world is going to be looking at seven Adventists. They're going to be beating a pathway to the door saying, how can I be a seven Adventist? I read what a prophet wrote in a book called Great Controversy. In the chapter, the final warning, the prophet says that these seven Adventists, that, that now they have received the spirit of God, the latter rain is poured upon them. It says their faces would light up and glow with the glory of God. They won't need makeup. They won't need jewelry. They're going to have the glory of Jesus shining from the inside out. They're going to walk on streets of gold. In heaven, gold is cheap material. They have found something better. They're shining with the glory of God. All of a sudden, the prophet says, she says, they will be going from city to city, from country to country, from village to village, to remote country places. It says that everywhere they go, miracles are going to follow them. Sick will be healed. Wonders will be wrought. It says that fire and miracles will follow the, the, the believers. It says thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like this. In amazement, they hear that the fallen churches, the old Babylon and Pentecostal and Baptist, they are true Christians, but the church, the system has fallen by rejecting the threefold message, Revelation 14. They hear that, that, that there's going to be a union of church and state. They hear that a Sunday law is going to be passed. They hear that Sunday is not the true seven-day Sabbath, but they hear it's the mark of the beast. They hear that the dead, when they die, don't go to heaven nor hell, but rest in the grave awaiting the resurrection. They hear that what they see, telling them that the day of worship has been changed from Saturday to Sunday, is not the dead, but the spirits of devils working miracles. They hear all of the truth of health reform and dress reform and music reform and education reform. They hear it all. They hear that they must get out of the city and go to the country places to grow their own fruits and vegetables because a Sunday law is passed when no man can buy or sell. And that many will receive the mark of the beast for fear of wanting food and clothing. And if you can't give up fish and chicken, you think you're going to give up the whole plate? If you can't give up an article of your plate, you know you're not going to give the whole thing up. They're going to hear this, brothers and sisters. And millions would have never heard that. They're going to come out of the churches and they're going to say, how can I be a seven Adventist? Where did you get this? And we're going to say, thy way, oh God, is in the sanctuary. Who is in the sanctuary? We're going to say, Jesus said, I am the way. She 
Jesus is the way in the sanctuary. They're going to hear it in order to get in there. They've got to walk by two legs of faith and works. The faith that works by love and purifies the soul. And they're going to do it not through fear or force, but love and choice. They love him so much. They're going to get victory over every sin. And do you know that they're going to look at our homes and they're going to say, they're going to see our homes, living out Adventist homes. They're going to see where we've gotten rid of all the divorces and they're going to say, we want homes like yours. We want children that are missionaries. We want an educational institution like yours. We want to live like you. How can you live and be the light of the world? And they're going to join. In fact, Revelation 18, look what it says. I'm not making this up. The Bible says this. Revelation 18, beginning in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. And after these things I saw, another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Verse 2 says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying what? Babylon, what? Is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has become the habitation of what? Devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Verse 3 says, the church and state would have united. The kings and the churches come together in fornication. Verse 4 says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying what? Now listen to this. That means that when that Sunday law is passed, that God still has people in churches that are habitations of devils. And he didn't call them Satan's people. That's not what he calls them. What do you call them? I told you, the majority of true Christians are not in the Seven Avenues Church tonight. 99% of us shaking out, the majority of true Christians are in the Catholic Church, Pentecostal Church, Four Baptist Church, Four Gospel Church. Then all these so-called churches going to church on Sunday, never heard these messages. The majority of true Christians are, are followers of God in the Hindu religion, Muslim religion, atheists, because of the hypocrisy of the remnant church. We're told that the sins of the world lie at the door of the church. Don't look down here and wonder why the brothers are selling marijuana and drugs when there's no man standing in the church. If the world could see real men, they wouldn't have their pants hanging down. They wouldn't have their hair like women. They wouldn't have themselves looking like everything else. They would stand in defense of the faith that was once delivered to the saints. My brothers and sisters, the Bible says, the Bible says that they're going to come out, the majority of true Christians in the other churches, and I told you that the greatest devils are in the seven heavens church, waiting only to be shaken out. And God is saying, please, I don't want you to be shaken out. I want to save us today. I don't know about you, but I want to be saved. Whatever, I don't care what it takes. Look, you can have the world, but give me Jesus. You think, that that's going to happen automatically. Look, before that loud cry happens and God brings millions into the church, God must first shake this church up. The prophet says, the Lord does not now work to bring what? Many souls where? Into the truth because of the what? Whoa, what do you say? The prophet says, God is not working now to bring many into the church, not because the worldlings don't need to come in, but he says, because of the what? Church. Now he says, the Lord does not what? Will he do it, yes or no? Yes. It's going to be a loud cry, but he's not going to do it now. Why not? It says, because of the church members who have what? Never been converted. Number one. You mean to tell me you could be a seven of innocent and never been converted? Yes. Those who are once converted, well, you couldn't be a real seven You could be one in name, but you couldn't be a real seven this. But those who are once converted, but who have what? Do you know that we have backsliders? We're backsliders today. We've got to get back. And the purpose of the plan of redemption is to take a backslider and bring him what? Back to Jesus. Praise God for the redemption plan. There's not just redemption. There is plenteous redemption. This says, what influence would these unconsecrated members have on what? What if God were to bring all of Trinidad in this community into the church and we're still playing the same music they're playing? Would they not make of no effect the God-given message which his people are to bear? God would be wasting his time. God, now listen, if God can't do it, don't expect me to do it. First revival and reformation. And when the church embraces revival and reformation, then it is in a better position to work to bring others in. This is what God wants to do in this church. And the question is, are you going to be a part of it? Now, my brothers and sisters, I never forget. Let me get ready to bring it to a close. I never forget. A sister took one of our evangelistic messages. Let me pass through this. I'm going to just go past this. I can't go through this now. I'm going to pass through this. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll get that. But the, the, 
the sister was passing out these messages. We were doing evangelistic meetings. And as we were doing the meeting, they passed out some of our messages. They took one of our messages on uh, 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 adornment, God's adornment pure, where we go through just the Bible and explain all of what God says about dress, adornment, all of that. Hallelujah. From the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. We're not doing that today, but I'm telling you about it. And so, as we went through it, the, the sister took the CD and gave it to one of her friends who are not seven Adventists. She went to one of these so-called four gospel churches. She gave it to her. And, and she didn't hear from her about two days, three days. And so she got scared. She said, maybe it was too straight. And so she got a little bit afraid. And all of a sudden, the friend called her. And she said, who was, the, who was that minister that uh, uh, was preaching on the table? She thought, man, she must not like that. So she said, well, she didn't know she wanted to tell him. She said, well, why do you ask? And then she said, well, well because I, what, who, who was the minister? And eventually she said, well, you know, his name was such and such, and uh, he's a Seventh-day Adventist minister, evangelist. All of a sudden, the woman said, no, he can't be a Seventh-day Adventist evangelist. And all of a sudden, the woman said, why do you say that? She said, what that man was preaching was holiness from the Bible. She says, my church can accept that from the Bible. She said, but he cannot be a seven evidence. She said, what do you mean? She said, he can't be. She says, I live in a community of seven day Adventists and none of them dress like that. All their skirts, mini skirts. All the, uh, the, 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 the spaghetti straps. All of the jewelry, the wedding bands and the rings on and the earrings on. All of the makeup on. She said, that is not what the Bible teaches. How can I join that church? Didn't it say it will make of none effect the message of God? This says experimental religion is known by but a few. The shaking must soon take place to purify the church and preachers should have no scruples to preach the truth as it is found where in God's word. Let the truth cut. I have been shown that why ministers have not more success is they are afraid of hurting what? You say, if you talk that straight, somebody will be afraid. But no, no, no. When you see a true princess and she tell, and you tell her that God doesn't condemn her, she's a princess. She's been brought with a price. She thanks you that you told her that. She loves the fact that she's valuable. She loves the fact that she's a princess. She loves the fact that someone will protect her and cover her and show her she's the most valuable thing in the world. As our seven at Venice, our women should be protected. Doors should be open for them. We shouldn't let them carry burden. I told my wife, I said, listen, you will never have to work a day in your life unless you're just doing service. It was the man's job to support the home. We've gotten away from the Bible truth. See, when a woman knows her value, she doesn't mind covering herself when she has a real man. It says they're afraid of hurting feelings, fearful of not being courteous, and they will lower the standard of truth and conceal if possible the peculiar rarity of our faith. Well, let me tell you something. Southern Baptist religion is not like any other religion. It's distinct, different, peculiar, based on the word of God, based on the plan of redemption, bringing us back to the position of Jesus. And someone says, well, but the young people will leave the church if you raise the standards. That's a bunch of foolishness. I know it's foolish. How you know? I'm going to tell you straight. The young people, they get it straight all the time. Those rappers telling them straight. They tell you kill each other. They tell you take the gun, gunja and kill you. Take the weed smoke and kill you. They tell you you're low. You only live once. That's what they tell you. But my brothers and sisters, listen to me. The young people are not running from standards. How do I know? Listen. Though young people are flocking to the world, but the standards of the world are not being lowered. The standards of the world are being raised higher and still higher. You say, what do you mean? Listen, there was a time when you could be in the world and all you had to do in the world was drink a little wine cooler and you were said to be worldly, but not now today. You got to pull out the Heineken and the Picardi. You got to drop down the rum. You got to put down it strong and straight in order to be in the world today. You got to top the 40 and put it to your head. The world is not lowering the standards and young people are flocking. What do you mean? Tell me something. There was a time when all you had to do in the world is get one earring in your ear if you were a man, two earrings in your ear if you're a woman. Not today. The man has two earrings. And the woman, she don't have two. She had an earring up here, going up and down the ear, earring in the nose, earring in the toes, earring in the belly button, even earrings from places I can't mention from the pulpit. I'm telling you. 
telling you what I know. The world is not lowering its standard. And young people flock the world. The world, you used to be in the world. There were times when all you needed was one tattoo to be in the world. But not today. Today, you look at the world today. The world has tattoo here and a tattoo here. Tattoo, full body tattoo. Tattoo on the eyes. Look at little, uh, little, what's that little man name? Little what? Little, uh, little Wayne. Close his eyes. He got tattoos on his eyelids. Well, he's out of his mind. He's never been taught what the truth was. You know what? Do you know that many of these rappers are going to come to the truth before you do? You know that some of them have actually contacted our ministry. They've been on YouTube, just Googled YouTube. They saw the message of music, and they hear the music, and these rock stars and rap stars and entertainment stars have called us and said, we hear the truth, and we will accept it. And then they come to a Seven Adventist church, and they say, we would have left the church because no one in that church is living like you preach. I'm telling you what I know. The world is not lowering its standards. The world is lifting its standards high. And young people are flocking to the world with mohawks and skinny jeans and green hair and purple hair and orange hair. They are not afraid of being different. It's you adults who are afraid of being different. When you give a young person this message and they see the peculiar, distinctive message, they pick it up, they start running with it, and they stand for the truth. God's going to have an army of youth that's going to take this message from, uh, from the world to world. We're told with such an army of our youth, rightly trained, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, soon coming Savior will go to all the world. Now, I believe the young people in this room. And Raven says, I saw that God cannot make such success. Well, the truth must be made pointed and the necessity of decision urged. And as false shepherds are crying peace and preaching smooth things, the servant of God, they can't preach smooth things. They must do what? Cry a lot. Someone says, will you do that? You won't be in trouble. That's true. Someone says, you do that, your hair will get chopped off. That's true. Someone says, you do that, you might be thrown out of the church. That's true. But Jesus was disfellowship. And Jesus didn't start a new church either. Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And those who finish the work must have the spirit of Moses and the Lamb. You know, Moses was given an opportunity to start a new movement. But Moses said, dear God, if I start a new movement, what will the Philistines and the heathens say? Will they say God started a movement and couldn't finish the work? Well, we must have the spirit of Moses and the Lamb. If they were to put me out of the church today, I would still say this is God's church by God's grace. I wouldn't start no new church. Where am I going to go? I'm going to say forgive them. They know what they're going to do. We must follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, what a difference a day makes. You know, everything we believe can only be proved from the 10th day of the why. Everything is based on time. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is what? And that glory takes in everything, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, whether it's diet, dress, education, music, worship, education, and life, all must be done to the glory of what? God. And let me get it really close. I'm going to pass this. Now, I talked about this. I'm going to pass this. I talked about this. I'm going to pass this. I talked about this. I passed this. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to pass. I can't talk about this right now. Now, the test is coming. The test is coming. I want to close right here. I can't show you this, but I'm going to tell you later on. If you don't get out of the city and grow your own fruits and vegetables, the next thing you're going to be eating is grubs. You know, the, the, the world is saying right now that by 2020, this says right here, most professors, the most important thing is getting people prepared because 2020 onwards, there won't be much choice. It says some academics believe that expense and environmental costs, raising livestock means that insect eating will be inevitable. And it has been claimed that by the end of this decade, insect eating will be widespread because there's not enough food to support 7 billion people. You better learn to grow your own fruits and vegetables. You know that right now, I was going to another country, and they had a documentary on the plane where they're showing right now they have delicacies of people making grasshopper spaghetti. They're making tarantula burgers, and people are eating insects. You better, be, you better read your labels. Read your labels. You know, they, they, they say up here, I can't read it, but they say up here, protein. They all they got to call is protein because, you know, cockroach is protein. So you better make sure when you read your label, you better make sure that you're not getting just a, you better know what you eat. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. Amen. All true obedience comes from the what? Heart. It was hard work with what? Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we should but be carrying out our own what? It's heart religion. It says, the will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight, not in doing what we think, but doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to what? Our 
our life will be a life of continual or what? First John 2 and 4 says the same thing. Through appreciation of the character of Christ, God is love. Through communion with God, sin will become what? See, when we hate sin, then we will have the enmity of Genesis 3.15 and we can crush the head of the serpent. It's hard giving up sin when you love it. And my brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us this. What is the last thing? I'm going to take these last 10 or so minutes to close on. We have but a few short months to get it right. Are you with me? God keeps a record with the nations. Through every century of the, this world's history, evil workers have been treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. And when the time has what? When the time has fully come, that iniquity shall have reached the stated what? Now we prove this from the word of God from the fair verse night, did we not? We found out that that's 6,000 years, the doctrine line. Did we see that? Of God's mercy, his forbearance will cease. Well, what event is going to let us know this? When the accumulated figures in heaven record books shall mark the sum of transgression complete, wrath will come unmixed with mercy, and then it will be seen what a tremendous thing it has been to have worn out the divine patience. This crisis of reaching the boundary will be reached when the nation shall unite and making void what? The first coming of Christ, when the great clock of time struck the first coming, there was a decree that let us know that the 4,000 year was reached. Am I right? And my brothers and sisters, we will find that when the 6,000 years almost reached, when Jesus is getting ready to come the second time, there will be another decree that's passed. And the reason says, what's the issue? God keeps the record with the nations. The figures are swelling against them in the books of heaven. And when it shall become a law that the transgression of the what day? That's a Sunday law. Then the couple before the limit will be reached. That means that there is a what? Does the Bible say that in Revelation 18? Remember Revelation 18? It says her sins will reach into what? Heaven. Revelation 18, 4, 5, and 6. It says that sins will reach into heaven. It says the flames that consume the cities of the plain shed their warning light down to our time. What is the city of the plain? Talk to me, somebody. What's the city of the plain? Sodom and what? What was the last social issue predominantly before the nation reached its limit? And the prophet says, that, the Bible says, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the last days. There's a limit. Do you know that if you study history, every time a generation was getting ready to reach its limit, the predominant social condition has always been homosexuality. Study Babylon, study Neo Persia, study Greece, study Rome, study the Jewish nation, study uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the last predominant condition. But there's a limit. And if God doesn't do something quick, he will have to apologize, I said, to Sodom and Gomorrah. It's here. Someone says, not in Trinidad. You better open your eyes. I've only been here a week, and I've seen it. You see more body men today than you see anywhere else. You see it everywhere you go. You see this. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that homosexuality is a sin just like any other sin? What is the hope for a homosexual? The plan of redemption. What's the hope of a fornicator? The plan, you see, our problem is we have, uh, have exalted the sin and we have hated the sinner when God hates sin but loves the sinner. There's a limit. There's a limit. Now, notice now, this says voters approve same-sex marriage for the what? This is 2012. Now, what I want you to see is this. This is what I'm going to take the last few minutes to do. First Sunday law in America then Sunday law around the world in Trinidad is going to be one of the first countries to do it. When Sunday law is passed, it is too late for Seventh-day Adventists to get ready. Now, my brothers and sisters, it's the time of the test. And if there's any teachers, I wonder if there are any teachers. Any teachers in this room today? Any teachers in this room? Any teachers here? No te Okay, I see a teacher there. When you give your student a test, is it time for them to study? It's, it's not time to get ready when you give them a test? When, it's when you give the test, it's time to already be ready. Not time to pull your books out. So when the Sunday law is given, it's time to take the what? It's too late to get ready when the Sunday law is passed. It's testing time. Now, what I want you to see is that whatever the condition of same-sex laws and marriages are, it will show us when the Sunday law is going to be passed. The same way the same sex is coming as a law, the Sunday law is coming the exact same way. Are you with me? Now, watch this. It says for the first time. What do you mean? It's the first time voters have approved same-sex marriage. This is in America, but it's worldwide. Now, you're going to find out that 
same-sex laws before were passed from the top to the bottom, but never from the not from the people, not as a grassroots movement. But we're going to find out the Sunday law is not going to come from the government first. You know that the people are going to demand a Sunday law. It's coming from the bottom to the top. Now, this is how same-sex marriage is. So when the, when, when the world is ready for same-sex marriage by law, then it's going to be ready for a Sunday law. Are you with me? It's the last condition before the limit is reached. We're going to prove that. Now, this says, rarely do popular votes reflect such a dramatic social what? But why are we seeing these changes now? Because we have to have a son in law so that judgment can pass from the dead to the, because of the great clock of, praise God. It says, it's hard to overstate the what? The national significance. In 2012, it started with two states in Maryland and another state, just two. But now my brothers and sisters in Maine, but just two. But now do you know that right now today, it's well past two now. That's 2012. But changes happen quickly and there's a reason we're going to go on. It says, in the 1990s, most Americans told posters that they did not know anyone close to them who was what? Could we get a Sunday law in 1990, yes or no? Not, why? Because in order to get a Sunday law, it has to be a majority what? Vote. And what we see about homosexuality, we're going to see the same thing about the Sunday law. Now, it says in 1990, they didn't even know many to them that were homosexual or gay. By 2020, the number of Americans who said they had gay or lesbian close friends or family members was what? Could they get the laws passed, yes or no? No, not in 2010. But they were close because 50-50, you can't get the laws. You have to have a majority vote. Is that right? But it said this year, that was 2012, that number stands at what? Can gay laws start coming through now? And that's why in 2012, the gay laws start. Now, you remember 2011, 7 billion people were reached for the first time in 2011. God finishes everything in what? Seven. Next year, 2012, homosexuality comes on the scene for the first time. Then the president comes out. I say respectfully, our pre the president of America, he said this, the second term president, this has never happened in history, he said gay marriages don't weaken families, it does what? And you better remember, it's all about the family. You better remember this, I'm talking about the son-in-law coming right now. It says that it doesn't uh, weaken families, it does what? Strengthen families. Now you better understand something. Do you know as you study the Bible, you will find out that there's something called twin institutions. Something called what? Twin institutions. Do you know that the twin institutions were given in the first seven days of creation? Remember, God declares the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, 8 and 9. Now, we're going to find out that something of the first seven days. What were the two twin institutions that you read in Genesis 1 and 2? What's the two twin institutions? Blessed days of Eden when God pronounced all things very good. Then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin as what? Twin institutions. Adventist home 340. Does the Bible say the same thing? If you were to go to Matthew 19, they asked Jesus about divorce. Go to Matthew 19 quickly. Go to Matthew 19 quickly. They asked Jesus about divorce. And Jesus defined divorce. Jesus defined marriage and divorce. Matthew 19 verse 4, the Bible says... And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the what? See, the best way to find out the answer to something is to go back to the beginning. God is always bringing us back. It says, He made them at the beginning male and what else? Verse 5 says, And said, For this call shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be what? And wherefore there are no more twain but one flesh, with therefore God have joined together. Let not man do what? So God defined marriage as one man, one woman. Is that right? Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve. All right. So it says, then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin, twin institutions. Genesis 1, what day did true marriage come on? Talk to me, somebody. The sixth day. What day did the Sabbath come on? Which one came first? First, true marriage. Then what? true Sabbath, and then the limit was reached. Is that right? And the prophet says, and the Bible teaches, they are indesirably linked together. There's a relationship between twins. Is that right? They're linked. But listen now, everything that God does, Satan has a... God has a true church, Satan has a... God has true prophets, Satan has a... God has true marriage, and Satan has a... What is the counterfeit marriage? Same sex marriage and it's linked with his false counterfeit sabbath what is this counterfeit sabbath counterfeit marriage counterfeit sabbath first counterfeit marriage must be legislated by law 
nationally. Then Sabbath of Sunday must be legislated by law nationally. National same-sex law, national Sunday law, and then the limit will be reached. Are you with me? You better watch this, brothers and sisters. You know what this is right here? Seventh Gay Adventist. This is a film that was put together in 2012 by some gay seven Adventists that wanted to bring gay into the church and make it acceptable. The LGBT funded it. It went to the theaters. It was all over. It went across PUC. It went across America. It went to the South. And you didn't hear about this? You better open your eyes. It's over, brothers and sisters. You better, listen, Solomon Gamar, do you know homosexuality was in Solomon Gamar for years? When did Solomon Gamar reach the limit? It was when homosexuality didn't start the night that it reached the limit. You know what happened? Homosexuality knocked on the door of Lot. Homosexuality was there. God said, that's all right. I got to deal with them. But when it knocked on Lot's door, God said, this far and no further. When it knocked on the door of the remnant, God said, the limit is reached this far and no further. It has knocked on the seventh day at Venice door. And now in our schools, we're trying to make safe places for homosexuals. We're to make safe places for sinners, not safe places for sin. God has made a sanctuary to save the sinner, but he's made a sanctuary to kill sin. We must love the alcoholic, but hate the alcohol. We must love the prostitute, but hate the prostitution. We must love the fornicator, but hate fornication. We must love the sinner, but hate sin. We must love homosexuals, but hate homosexuality, brothers and sisters. Seventh-day gay Adventists. It's over, and you will find out that immediately after 2013, you're going to find out something happened. And all of a sudden, this is our article, and Gleaner and the, and the gay, gays and the family, they start talking about having this. And now, do you know, just a few months ago, there was a chaplain, a PUC, preached a sermon called Adam and Steve. Now, I didn't make a mistake. Not Adam and Eve, Adam and Steve. And he's just that, which is what he meant. He said, do you know, in the last days, God is going to call an audible, and God will accept homosexuals in the church. He will accept them in the ministry. He will accept them, and God will say that there's nothing wrong with it. And they gave him a standing ovation. As of now, there's been so much uproar, they removed it from the website, but it's still on YouTube. It's still there. Gays in the family. You better understand something. God loves the sinner. But do you know that this meant something? You know that was 2012 when that knocked on the door of seven Adventists. What happened the very next year? 2011, seven billion. Limits reached. 2012, all of a sudden, we see the gays knock on the church. 2013, we see that a new pope was elected in 2013 called Pope Francis. Who was not just an ordinary pope, but he's the first openly professed Jesuit pope. It said, this pope is different. The man who went over the world in five minutes. It says, we have never seen the pope become so popular in just a couple of minutes. A French historian, an expert of religion said this has never happened. But the Bible says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed in all the world. What wonder after the beast. He's the first Jesuit pope. You don't know what that means. Hopefully we can tell you what it means before it's over. But I got to move on today and close. Do you know that the prominent gay rights magazine honors the what? for the first time that even the Pope is held by homosexuals. Because remember, the homosexual Sabbath and homosexuals have to end up joining. Person of the Year, the advocate is the leading, most, uh, the largest homosexual uh, magazine in the world, and the Pope is there. You know why? Because he says something. Look what the Pope said. He said, if someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? We shouldn't marginalize people for this. They must be integrated into society. You talking about a Jesuit? This is a Jesuit pope. See, Jesuits, they know how to do anything like a chameleon just to get what they need to do. And let me tell you something. Listen to me. This pope knows how to pope. And this pope is coming to America what year? This is the first woman president of a general conference. Uh, not general conference, but of a conference in California. It made history. This, I was there with the very place that she was doing just a few weeks ago during the meeting. Maybe last week during the meeting. Last Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath before last. It says on the vote, the president of the general conference said don't do it, but they did it anyway. 
the North American Division president disagreed with the General Conference president, moved out of the General Conference and moved to a billion that cost millions of dollars and set up his own billion and said he's going to start doing it anyway. And you talking about this not getting ready to be a split in this church? You're out of your mind. A shaking is coming. And we're sitting down, closing our mouths, afraid to talk. Where are those that are going to stand in defense of the faith that was once delivered to the saints? And whether you like it or not, women's ordination is the move that people are thinking about in 2015, but that's not really there. I told you, I was in Maryland, and people at the general conference came and secretly told me that when the meetings, that they said, we must bring this first to the leaders before we bring it to the people, and the ballots were take it, taken secretly and voted, and the real issue is not women's ordination. The real issue is they're trying to ordain homosexual pastors in the Seventh Adventist Church. Study your history. I don't make it up. Study your history. Get on the internet. Study it. Every Christian church that has ordained women pastors, the next step, they have ordained homosexual pastors. The limit is getting ready to be reached. And the general conference session is this year. Pope comes to America this year. Why? This is the great clock of time. Now, my brothers and sisters, gay marriage once inconceivable, now it appears what? It says it's coming. They said that after gay marriage, it says another class is going to come on the issue of religious why. I'm talking about their twin institutions, but listen to this. I got to go. I got to close. This says, this came out January. U.S. Supreme Court to rule on same-sex marriage what? You better understand this. January this month, you know, they once said, they said that we're going to wait until they got 40 states. When 40 states in America have become a same sex, then they said they're going to take it to the Supreme Court, get a same sex law for the nation. But all of a sudden, something happened. There are 38 states that already accepted it, but they didn't stop there. The Supreme Court said, we're going to stop going state by state. The Supreme Court said, this year, 2015, we're going to make a law for the nation. U.S. Supreme Court to rule on the same sex this year. Setting the stage for the potentially historic ruling, the Supreme Court announced Friday it would decide whether same-sex couple have a right to marry everywhere in America under the what? That's the highest court in the land. It says the justice will take gay rights cases that ask them to declare for the entire what? That means if this is passed by the Supreme Court, there will be a national same-sex what? Law. You better understand that. That is coming. And they said they're going to decide on it on what? It says the cases will be argued April this year, expected by late what? June, right around general conference session. Then it says, look now, it says now there are just 14 states in which same-sex couples cannot wed. The court's decisions to get involved is another marker of the what? The prophets, the rapid change, the prophets said the final movements will be. This is happening now. Why? Because of the great clock of time says Sunday law. But before Sunday law, the first twin must be born. In June, they're going to decide on delivering the first twin to the United States of America. Now, it's twin institutions. Is that right? Which come first? Six day, then seven day. False marriage by law nationally, then Sunday law nationally. My brothers and sisters, are there any twins in this room today? Any twins in this room? Any twins in this room? I can't see a hand. Any twins? I see a hand. Now, listen. All right, there's a twin. Who was born first? You or the, your twin? How? You say what? The boy was born first. Now, I want to ask you a question. How long was the next twin born after the first twin? 20 years. Just a few moments. Is that right? There's a relationship how twins come into the world. And these twin institutions are the same. This one comes in first. We're getting ready to see the first twin born this summer. And my brothers and sisters, that means that it's time for the birth of the second twin. Not few years from now, not year after year after year. We are living in the last few moments of Earth's history. And we're playing with God. Talking about I want to go home and, and, and have some lay activities and lay down. Do you know that when this same law is passed, everybody's going to wake up, every seven Adventist young person that's been listening to music, that's been playing with the world, that's been careless in church, that's been sleeping, that wants to go home, they're going to wake up and say, how can I get to know Jesus? But it's going to be too late then. Leaders in the church, leaders in the home, leaders and members and laity are going to say, what, what can I do? But at that time, it's going to be too late. I'm going to tell you something, it's not too late right now. We need Jesus. 
we need Jesus. And whatever has to be let go in my life, we need to be willing to let it go. Amen? I'm going to close with this. Let me black this out before I get tempted to keep going. Listen to me. Listen to me. A friend of mine who was a uh, pastor of one of the, our Caribbean islands, when he first came into the church some years back, he was just a young elder, and he told me this true story. It happened to him and some people he were with. He just became a young elder. And as he was there on this particular island, similar to this, it wasn't this island, but similar to this, uh, all the elders were coming there. The pastor was there. The elders were sent out to pray for a particular woman, a, a mother. She came and said, I need you to pray for my daughter. And so they gathered the elders of the church and said, we'll pray for him. They didn't find out the details. They just said, we're going to go and pray. And so all of a sudden, the elders of the church all came together. They took the young elder with him. He was newly brought in. They wanted him to get some experience. So they brought him to the house. And my friend was telling me the story that they brought. And so he went to the house. And when he got in the house, they weren't explained what was going on. But he saw the little girl. The little girl was young. The little girl was not a, a, a very old. She was probably about 12 years old. And they looked at her, and she was on the bed, but something was strange. She was chained to the bed. Chains on both of her arms, chains on the bed cover. And she's chained there. And as she's sitting there chained, all of a sudden, they, the, the men said, and they went back out of the room, went to the mother, and they said, wait a minute, why is your daughter chained to the bed? I thought you wanted us to pray for her. What you What's going on? They said, you don't understand. My daughter is possessed by demons. That little girl had supernatural strength. She could lift the bed up and it would almost be levitating. She would pull the stuff. She, she had more strength than the men. She could pick a one and just throw them around the room. Along the floor, the young man that was there, he said, look at the sign. He saw about five large rum bottles. I'm not talking about wine coolers. You know what rum is, don't you? Strong, undiluted. And she had drunk maybe three or four bottles at the age of 12 and she was still acting like it was normal. Now a man, he drinks a bottle, he's out. And this little girl had drunk this and she used to drink. The man looking at this, he said, man. He said, because he was in the world, he used to lick the rum bottle before he gave it to his uncle. And he was almost drunk before he got to his uncle. And she had put down three, four. All of a sudden, he says, man. So all of a sudden, the elder said, well, let's go in. Okay, well, she has a demon. Let's pray for her. So they go in and they, they get around the, the girl and they said, let's pray. And they begin to grab hands. They begin to start singing songs. And then they said, let's pray. And so all of a sudden, the head elder went up and the head elder said, Let's pray that the demon is cast out. And the demon, the head elder went over to, to, the, to the girl, and he says, let's get ready to pray. And he got ready to pray, and the little girl opened her eyes. Boom. And she looked at him. And she started talking with an unnatural voice. And she said, she called the elder by name. Elder so-and-so, what are you doing here? And the elder said, start off. She never met him before. She called him by name. She said, elder, where were you last night? Listen to me. Where were you last night? The other started. He said, what about deaconess so-and-so? All of a sudden, the elder turned colors, got out of the room, and left. The next elder came up, and the elder was getting ready to pray, and the little girl looked at him and said, elder. And the elder looked up. She said, where were the elder took off? <laughs> Third elder, all of a sudden, the elder start clearing the room, and the woman, the little girl, starts pointing out the sin. You see, the devil knows every sin he's caused you to commit. He knows every time when you snuck and got on pornography. He knows every time when you committed adultery and fornication, and no one knew about it, not your wife, not your, he knows every sin, and he brings it up to shame you. They start emptying out the room. That young elder said he felt the convicting spirit of God. He said, all of a sudden, the other elder grabbed him and said, brother, let's go out while we still have time. Grab them outside. They went out of the room. He said, look, look, look. What we need to do, God is merciful. Let us confess our sins to Jesus. That young man, that other elder was there. They got on the ground. They split apart from each other. They started searching everything in their life. That brother started going back when he was three years old, and he stole the candy out of the candy jar. Every sin, he went back. Everything that no one, he started praying and cleaning and, and claiming sins. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. 
Then all of a sudden, the elder and the young man came back. They said, we confessed every known sin. We claim the blood of Jesus. Let's go back in there now and help this young girl. They went back in there and they start singing, not some choruses. You know, look, you look. When, when the devil comes into your room, you know you don't start singing Kirk Franklin. Star. You're not singing some uh, uh, Lionel Harris and Richard Smallwood and some of these crooning songs. <laughs> they going to do nothing to the devil. You say, I don't, the devil don't care how much riffs you do. The devil is frightened by the word of God. And the hymns carry the word of God. They didn't sing that. They started singing those sweet songs of Zion. They went back to those old hymns. And all of a sudden, as they started singing those old hymns, all of a sudden the spirit came into the place. That old elder began to pray. And the young elder prayed. And the Holy Spirit came down and removed the demon out of that little girl. There are secret sins in this room right now. I may not have mentioned them, but Jesus will tell you things that no man will ever tell you. But today, there's enough time to come to Jesus. Do you want to come to him? Let's come.